Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good evening and welcome to Friday night FOJC Remnant Gathering. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper and when two or three are gathered in his name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us and here's Brother David. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the March 10th, excuse me, to the February the 10th. No, we are in March. It is March? I was right. Oh, my goodness. God, it is. Man, that don't seem right, but yeah, it is March 10th, 2023 edition of the FOJC Remnant Gathering. I am David Carrico, and we're so thankful for each and every one of you joining us for a broadcast this evening. Our broadcast for this evening is going to be entitled, The Ten Virgins. We have a lot to pray about, as always. We want to pray for Sister Donna for continued healing. We want to pray for Bonnie Swank. She is newly saved, and that's what we want to see. We want to see people born again into the kingdom of God. That's what it's all about, and we're seeing that. So we want to pray for Sister Bonnie, who has a new member of the kingdom of God. We want to pray for Raymond for healing and wisdom for his family. We want to pray for Andy and Denise, that there will just be a hedge of protection around them. We have a praise report. Uh, Been praying for Brother Cecil and his nosebleeds, and they are better. Praise God. Continue to pray for healing for Brother Cecil and continue to pray for all of our new projects we're engaged in here at FOJC. The new edition of Enduring Sound Doctrine went up this afternoon on He Walks With Us Everywhere. I was very pleased with that. And this Sunday night at 8 p.m. Central, the Redneck History Channel will be back. Yes, that's right, the Redneck History Channel, and it'll be on our Rumble channel. It will not be on. We've been on the Underground Church YouTube channel the last two Sunday nights. This Sunday night, it will be on our Rumble channel. So be watching for that this Sunday night at 8 p.m. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you. For all your blessings toward us, we just ask you, Lord, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us and bring us into your presence. Father, we just pray that you just touch Sister Bonnie, just touch her and enable her to grow just strong and tall in your kingdom. We just ask that you touch Sister Donna and just give her a the spiritual healing and the spirit physical healing and strength she needs we want to pray for Raymond for healing and for wisdom and for protection for his family we want to pray for Andy and Denise that habit of protection will be around them we just thank you father for the answered prayer for brother Cecil and we just pray for continued healing for him and strength And Father, we just want to pray for all of our projects. We want to pray for our broadcast Sunday night, our live stream, and we want to pray for this broadcast this evening, that you'll just use it to bring more people into the kingdom. That's what it's all about, Father. We just pray that you you just give us souls for the kingdom in Jesus' name. And we just ask this in, in faith believing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Worship the Lord for a few moments, and we'll be back with our study for this evening, The Ten Virgins. We're sorry, but because of copyright rules, you cannot hear my music. However, if you want to hear the message in its entirety with my music, 
You can join us on the radio page on Friday nights for the live audio broadcast at 6 p.m. Central Time, or you can listen on our podcast page at fojcradio.com. Here's Brother David. Turn your Bibles to Matthew, the 25th chapter, the parable of the ten virgins. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for your lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. Hey guys, how you lest, doing? This is the chief here. Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Now this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is not talking about the world. This is talking about born-again people that are in the kingdom. And five are wise and five are foolish. And this tells us something that people that are born again can do foolish things. And that's why we have to be aware that we need to do the things we need to do lest we become foolish. And there's no doubt that this parable is directed unto the people of the kingdom. Well, this is what the kingdom is like. And it shows us in Scripture what a virgin is. And when we're talking about virgin here, we're talking about a spiritual virgin. You can be married and you can be a spiritual virgin. In Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 to 4, and this is really ground zero of what determines of whether you're a spiritual virgin or not. The Apostle Paul said in Second Corinthians 11, beginning in the second verse, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We are to be chaste virgins to Christ with no other lovers with no other authority over us but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ this is how Satan tricks the virgins into being foolish virgins he corrupts them from the simplicity that is in Christ. Christ is so pure. Christ is so right. Christ is so simple. He is so worthy of our trust. He is so worthy of our belief. But Satan will tell us, you have to add this to Jesus. You have to add that. It's And it's, it's just awful the way that he fools people and he's so successful at it in the fourth verse Paul said for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received or another gospel which ye have not accepted ye might well bear with him and in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 4 there's the definition enhanced of what a spiritual virgin is. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 4, it says of the 144,000, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. They follow Jesus. They are espoused unto Him. They are absolutely focused upon following Jesus with no other husbands over them. Now in Scripture, there's a dividing line between the wise and the foolish. 
And it is laid down in this, in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And in Proverbs chapter 9 and the 10th verse, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding there is no wisdom without the fear of God and for these virgins to be virgins at any point in time they had to have the fear of God but there was something that caused them to veer from the fear of God and as long as we have the fear of God the fear of God will fix just about anything that's wrong with us the fear of God will take care of it and in scripture There's a lot of different arguments and a lot of different opinions on what the fear of God is. And uh, they'll say and they'll make explanations, well, that really doesn't mean that we fear him. Well, the Bible defines it pretty good. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 18, with the giving of the law upon, upon the mount, it says, and all the people saw the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the noise of the thunder, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. They were afraid. They were backing up. They saw the mountain of smoking and rocking, and they were backing up. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. They were afraid. And they were afraid they were going to die. That's what the fear of God is. We need the fear of God. And that will keep us wise instead of foolish. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. If we're not living in sin, and if we're not walking in sin, we have no reason to fear God. But if you try to stick your finger in God's eye, you better fear or you're going to be a most foolish person. In Proverbs, the 10th chapter, and the 14th verse, Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Wise men will constantly be studying to show themselves approved first of all in the word of God they'll be studying to unpack the lies that are being forced upon us from every direction of this old wicked world wise men will indeed lay up knowledge and they'll seek out the truth in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 2 a fool hath no delight in understanding but his heart but that his heart may discover itself. And that's what a fool is. A fool, and there's so many people, and you can spot them, they wanna wanna listen and they wanna follow, but they don't really wanna learn. They just wanna be there to say what they think, to shoot off their opinion, to put their little two cents worth in. Uh, Trolls is a good word for them. A fool hath no delight in understanding but that his heart may discover itself. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 2. And the bottom line of what separates those that are wise from those that are foolish, just like it, it said the Apostle Paul, we have been espoused unto one husband, and that is Jesus Christ. We are set apart unto him. And in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 26 and 27, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. That is the biblical definition of the doctrine of Christ from Jesus himself. Those things that he said, Jesus said, if you listen and obey the things that I say, 
you're going to be wise. Many, many people are turned away from the doctrine of Christ to the doctrines of men, and Satan is so successful into steering them off of the path. I want to read something from Thomas Shepard. Thomas Shepard wrote a book that is 629 pages long on the parable of the ten virgins. And Thomas Shepard, there's still a plaque to him in the uh, courtyard of Harvard University, and I'm surprised it's still there. Thomas Shepard was a Puritan, and he was one of the original founders of Harvard University. He was one of the original men on the board. He was the primary spiritual emphasis. He was the pastor of the church there in Cambridge for several years. And it's such a it's such a shame that such a marvelous beginning as a God fearing Puritan institution has been turned into the absolute godless sham that it is. But I want to read something from Thomas Shepard. He said that in those days of Christ's coming, wherein the churches of Christ and professors of the gospel shall grow virgin churches. Now I want us to think about that. That in the days before the Lord's return, that there will be virgin churches. Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. At the time before the return of Christ, there will be virgin churches. There is going to be a separation of the wise from the foolish. And to have virgin churches, there must be a separation. And indeed, that separation is going on now and it's not something that you have to start the first church of the self-righteous Pharisee that separation is going to happen it's going to happen naturally it's it's becoming very very clear where people stand and uh, and it, it, people are just revealed what they are and where they stand and this is an ongoing process brother Shepherd goes on to say some there are who think the days we live in now are not only the days of the Son of Man, but part of the days of the coming of the Son of Man, wherein the churches, especially in these places, grow to be virgin professors. We're going to have a birth of many virgins into the kingdom of God. That is such good news. People are being born again and they're coming into the pure truth of Christ, to be dedicated to Christ, to Christ and Christ only, walking in his grace, walking in his blood, walking in his doctrine. This is what we must do. We must grow virgin churches. It says our members are and must be visible saints visible believers, virgins espoused to Christ, escaping the pollutions of idolatry and the world. To have virgin churches, there must be a separation. And this is just all too obvious, isn't it? And this is what the scriptures say in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. The scripture says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And verse 27 says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is the virgin church. The virgin church is the one that's been purified with the hot iron. To get the wrinkles out of the dress, you got to put the hot iron on it. And Jesus is going to be putting a hot iron on us. Because at the time of his return, there's going to be virgin churches. There's going to be virgin believers that are going to do a marvelous work for him. And that work is bringing souls into the kingdom of God. Lifting up Jesus. Lifting up the gospel. Lifting up soul winning. Lifting up and emphasizing sound doctrine that we can grow up and be instruments for the Lord. And for that to happen, there has to be a separation. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 7, excuse me, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7, 
And the scripture says here, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Jesus is coming back for a bride. He's not coming back for a whore. There will be a whore. And right now, people are being deceived into that harlot church. Jesus is coming back to judge that harlot church, but he is coming back to catch up his bride. And to be a virgin, to be a spiritual virgin, let's look at it. In the Song of Solomon. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and verse 16, these are the words on my wedding ring. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. That's what it is to be a spiritual virgin. Jesus is yours and he, my beloved is mine and I am his. There you go. And that's it. You belong to Jesus and Jesus belongs to you. And that's what it means. There's no other lovers between you and Jesus. There's no other doctrine. There's no other focus of your faith. And that's what it means to be a spiritual virgin. Now, to be a spiritual virgin you have to put away your marriage to anyone else. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. We are dead to the law. Now notice the Bible doesn't say that the law is dead. But we are dead to the law. The law in Romans 3.20 For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We preach the law that the, the knowledge of sin might abound. We preach the law because sin is transgression of the law. Those Ten Commandments are still just as good as the day they were given on. The law is not dead, but we are dead to the law because we are focused on Christ. We are in the New Covenant. We are not under the Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant, people look to that Levitical sacrificial system. In the New Covenant, we look to Christ. And that's what so many people do today. They, they want to go, and this is because of the leaven from that Hebrew root cult. And I know this is one of the hardest things to understand. Because on the left side of the road, you've got the Hebrew root cult. And on the right side of the road, you've got the dispensationalist cult. And the one will try to put you into works righteousness, and the other will try to throw the law out altogether. And there's a ditch on both sides of the road here. Now, we are dead to the law. We don't go to the book of Leviticus and try to obey the Le Le Levitical law like when Israel was in the land, but we go to Christ in the new covenant. And when we go to Christ in the new covenant, we will fulfill the law by faith and our obedience to the law will be written on our heart and we will rejoice to obey all of God's moral law and we will establish the law by faith and indeed the law can never be established but by a principle of heart obedience in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The Bible doesn't say Christ is the end of the law, but the end of the law for righteousness. There is no way you can get saved by law keeping. There's no way you can be sanctified by law keeping. It's totally by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, but this in no way mitigates the moral importance of not only of the Ten Commandments, but of all of God's moral law. And so many people stumble over this stumbling block. It's something that needs to be talked about 
and needs to be talked about often. And we need to read the scripture that we've read often, and I don't think we can read it too much. Matthew 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. How can anyone that claims to be a child of God throw out the law. You have to totally disregard what Jesus said, and that is indeed what our what the dispensationalists do. Now in Romans chapter three and verse thirty one, it's equally as bad you can be married to the law by coming into a works righteousness understanding either of salvation or sanctification and in Romans chapter 3 and verse 31 the scripture says and this was John Wesley's text on his great sermon on this topic Romans chapter 3 and verse 31 do we then make void the law through faith God forbid yea we establish the law how many foolish versions virgins are there that either go the way of the Hebrew root, which is just the spirit of Antichrist, or either go the way of dispensationalism, which was equally the spirit of Antichrist. The only thing that will save and the only thing that will sanctify is the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed upon the cross. The only thing that will give us the ability to fulfill the law by faith is the Holy Spirit implanted in us, the law written in our heart in the new covenant. In Romans 8 and 4, Paul put it like this, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That will be the fulfillment of the law in the righteous sight of God. It's always been love that's fulfilled the law. People under the old covenant, they could not perfectly keep the law any better than we do, but Love fulfills the law when the Father knows that out of a heart of love, the law written on our heart, that we do our very best to please him in the fear of God. This is where it's at. That is the straight and narrow path that we want to strive to go through. Back in our text in Matthew 25, let's look at the second and the third verses. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 2. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Let's get a definition from Brother Thomas Shepard of what the oil is. He said, for the oil, what is it? If any ask the difference between the virgins... The foolish want, and the wise have, an inward principle of the spirit of life. And that says it so simply and so beautifully. There's an active principle of the Holy Spirit in a wise virgin. The foolish virgin has lost that intimate relationship with Christ that relationship that leads them and speaks them and keeps them in God's presence and convicts them of their sin and their wrong if you have Christ within you and if you're living in relationship with him following him you are indeed a wise a wise virgin in Matt in Matthew Henry's commentary on page 368 of his commentary on Matthew. He said they they had just oil enough to make their lamps burn for the present, to make a show with as if they intended to meet the bridegroom, but no cruiser bottle of oil with them for a recruit if the bridegroom tarried, thus hypocrites. How many people do you know 
that profess Christ that you could pretty much say their motto for for their Christian walk is to get by with just as little as they can to just barely do the very least possible yeah I believe in Jesus but you know there's not a whole lot after that's just the attitude of so many isn't it that's not a wise way to be that's a foolish way to be to just try to you know the old expression to just get into heaven by the skin of your teeth well we'll get into the heaven by the grace of God brother Henry goes on they have not in their hearts that stock of sound knowledge remember the proverb the fool does not lay up knowledge the wise man does and they don't have that sound doctrine that will help them to endure that's why I'm so thrilled about our little series we're doing on he walks with us everywhere enduring sound doctrine that's what we need we have to have that and if you're not you're you're not wise you're foolish if you think you can make it through what's coming without a real sound foundation in the Word of God, you're kidding yourself. You're not wise, you're foolish. They have not in their hearts that stock of sound knowledge, rooted disposition, and settled resolutions which is necessary to carry them through the services and trials of the present state says Brother Henry. He goes on, they have no prospect of nor make provision for what is to come. They live like today is it. They have no idea where we're at in God's spiritual time clock. They think only of the present moment. He says they do not provide for hereafter as the ant does, nor lay up for the time to come. Listen to that. I'll read that again. They do not provide for hereafter as the ant does, nor lay up for the time to come. And the ant is a very good teacher for us. And in the book of Proverbs, beginning in verse 6 of chapter 6, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. And you know, a lot of people are just lazy. They're lazy physically, in the affairs of their life, and they're lazy spiritually. Lazy, lazy, lazy. They don't want to study to show themselves to prove. They don't want to endure sound doctrine. They don't want to avail themselves of the means of grace that would make them wise and strong and keep that active principle of the Spirit alive within them. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 6 Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. This is how you be wise. Study the ant, which have no guide, overseer, or ruler. Provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep? Now as we go on in the parable of the ten virgins, we're going to see some sleeping and some slumbering. And a lot of people are sleeping. They are sleeping when they should be working. They're sleeping when they should be providing themselves the spiritual and material things they need for that which is upon us. O sluggard, when will thou arise out of thy sleep? Wake up, sluggard. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man." O oh, sluggard, po- poverty's coming for you. Po- poverty is coming for you, sluggard. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, there's another way to lay up that strong foundation. Let's look at it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18. They that do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute willing to communicate be willing to give be willing to bless for the need is to bless and look in verse 19 laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come isn't that something the way to lay a good foundation for the time to come is to distribute 
and communicate to those that are in need. Praise God. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Praise God. Praise God. In Matthew chapter 25, and let's look at the fourth verse. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 4. And the scripture says here, But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. The wise took oil. Now, there's a comment I want to read by Brother Matthew Barnes. Matthew Barnes, Albert Barnes. I got Matthew Henry and I got Albert Barnes commentary on Matthew. And Brother Barnes said this. He said, oil in their vessels. The five foolish virgins probably expected that the bridegroom would come immediately. They therefore made no provision for any delay. Let me tell you, the delay will kill you. Now, you can hear a message on getting right with God and preparing yourself spiritually and preparing yourself uh, physically, and you can get all excited, and that's good, but it's easy to grow cold when the delay comes, and uh, it's easy to study the signs of the coming of the Lord and the things that happen, and I don't know how long it's going to be, but I tell you this, um, all of the talk and all of the neocon rhetoric of sending um, the Abrams tanks and all of these things over to Dr. Z over there in Europe, already Mr. Putin has promised that if that happens, he's going to use tactical nuclear weapons. Now, I don't think that anybody takes him very seriously. But like the old saying, if you scratch a Russian, you'll find a Tartarian, and they might be whistling by the graveyard. And this could get out of hand so fast. I don't know if it will. Uh, I don't know uh, just when the shoe's going to drop, but I know it's going to drop, and I know it's a perfect storm out there. There's a perfect storm in so many directions, and I know you all know that. You know, you're very intelligent. You know what's going on. And you know the reality of the situation. It's time to be a wise virgin, isn't it? It's time to be wise. And it's time to encourage those that are foolish. We need to admonish them that you need to get ready. And we need to to tell those that have been living in spiritual and physical preparation, don't let the delay kill you. Do not let the delay kill you. Let's look at Matthew 24. And after we read this text, we're going to take our break in Matthew, the 24th chapter. And let's look at the 44th verse. Therefore, be ye also ready. Now, boy, that's the word for the day, isn't it? Therefore, be ye also ready. Ready today, ready tomorrow, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh, who then is a faithful and wise servant. Now, in this teaching here in Matthew 24, Jesus couches it in the terms of the faithful and wise servant and the evil servant. In Matthew 25, he uses the contrast between the wise and the foolish virgin. And the faithful servant and the evil servant, these are the same contrast as the wise virgin and the foolish virgin. Let's read it. Matthew 24, and let's read on here in, uh, in verse 45. 40, Forty-five, It says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. And that that's only spiritual food. For sure, we want to give out spiritual food, but I guarantee you, uh, as I told this one fellow that was chiding me for 
teaching that it's wise to prepare physically for that which is coming. I told him that about 48 hours after Walmart shuts down, you're going to get a revelation from God. And he said, well, what's that? And I says, that revelation is that you like to eat. And you like to eat on a regular basis. And that revelation is going to catch on real quick. We need to be wise and not foolish. In verse 47, Verily I say unto you, He shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an, and, and in an hour, that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And with that, we're going to take our break. And after that, we're going to be back with a whole lot more on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. We'll be right back. This is Tracy Vinay from He Walks With Us Everywhere over on YouTube. Knowing the doctrine of Christ is the most important thing in your life, whether you know it or not, as David Carrico says. We are excited to bring you the sound doctrine we need to endure these last days. Our newest original series, Enduring Sound Doctrine, is now airing on my YouTube channel. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I like to say it's not a hop, skip, and jump to the end. It's an enduring. We welcome you to come over to He Walks With Us, one word, everywhere, and subscribe, like, and share. And please remember to subscribe, like, and share FOJC Radio's YouTube channel, Underground, one word, church. Thank you for listening to the content that we're presenting, and of course, for your support and your love and your prayers. We hope to see you over there. Now back to tonight's message with Brother David Carrico on FOJC Radio. Welcome back to the FOJC Remnant Gathering. And as I always do at the break, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you that studies with us and prays for us and supports us with your gifts and your kindness. We do appreciate it so very, very much. We're going to get back in our study, and we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 25 in the fifth verse. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. It is during the period of the delay that many of the wise virgins are going to be wiped out and tricked into being a foolish virgin taking themselves off of a state of readiness now sleep's not necessarily a bad thing isn't it sleep can be a very good thing it's not good to be asleep spiritually but sleep is a good thing too in the song of solomon chapter 5 and verse 2 i sleep but my heart waketh have you ever had the Lord commune with you uh, while you're asleep with his sweet spirit? And I know there's times when I will go to bed wondering about something and thinking about something, and when I wake up, the Lord will just show me the answer. You can sleep, but your heart can be awake spiritually. You can be in a state of readiness that when you awake, all you got to do is trim your lamps and you're going to be ready to go. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. We are awake, and we are ready when our Lord speaks. We sleep, but truly our heart waketh. And there is a sleeping that is not so good. Uh, also and in, in Exodus chapter 40 in Exodus chapter 40 the thing as brother Shepherd said distinguishes 
the wise from the foolish. What the oil is, is the, the, the active principle of faith in Christ in our heart, the Holy Spirit within us from Christ. And if we have that, we have the presence of God with us. And when we awake from our sleep, we awake in the presence of God, ready to follow his voice, ready to follow his leading. In Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. We don't want to move outside of the presence of God. You don't want to move outside of the peace of God. If you don't have the peace of God in what you're doing, you don't need to be doing it. If you're not if you don't have the presence of God in what you're doing, you don't need to be doing it. The scripture says in the epistle of Romans the 8th chapter and the 14th verse, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If we have the oil within, we have the wisdom of God to lead us in His presence and in His peace. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, in the 5th and the 6th verse, there's something that I think we're going to hear very soon in Matthew chapter 25 in the 6th and the 7th verse and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps and there's going to be a midnight cry and when that midnight cry goes forth It's time for people to get ready to meet the Lord. Now, this wasn't the actual coming of the Lord. Now, when the Lord returns, we're going to have that period of tribulation before he returns, and nobody's going to miss that. There's going to be a midnight cry, and whether it's going to be from the hand of man, from a nuclear exchange, or whether the hand of God will move first from a a heavenly luminary causing absolute disaster, I don't know which is going to come first, but it's going to happen. There's going to be a midnight cry that there's a massive disaster that will forever change our way of life upon this earth and there will be a midnight cry and the virgins will all cry all ten of them let's get ready to go meet Jesus then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps now if you're a wise virgin all you've got to do is wake up and just cut that excess off your wick. You're ready to go. But if you don't have your oil, if you don't, you're not ready. I tell you what, when the midnight cry comes, you're not going to be ready to go. And in the book of Judges, the 16th chapter, there's a very good spiritual illustration of spiritual sleep. And it's it's in the story of Samson. And we know the story of Samson and Delilah. And Samson liked to sleep with his head in the lap of Delilah. That's where so many believers are right now. They are sleeping with their head in the lap of Delilah. In Judges chapter 16, beginning in verse 19, And she made him sleep upon her knees. Now they all slumbered and slept, but when them foolish virgins slept, they were sleeping in the lap of Delilah. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not, that the Lord was departed from Kim. There are foolish virgins right now. You don't even know the Lord's departed from you. 
you once had that active principle of life within you. You were excited about Jesus. You were on fire for God. You were doing the things you needed to do. But somehow in the delay, you have grown cold and you have grown foolish and you don't even realize the Lord departed from you. The Philistines be upon thee was the midnight cry. That was the midnight cry for Samson, but he couldn't grow hair that fast, could he? It would take a while for Samson to get his hair back, and it takes a while to do the things that need to be done to prepare a person spiritually and to prepare a person physically. And when the midnight cry comes, we need to make sure all we got to do is trim our lamps and we're good to go. Don't let the delay kill you. Do not go to sleep with your head in the lap of Delilah. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 8 and 9, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Now, as we continue interpreting this parable, when the foolish virgin said, Our lamp has gone out, this means the absolute loss of salvation. And as we go forth, unpacking this verse by verse, this becomes undeniable. And their lamps had gone out. They didn't know the Lord had departed from them. They had totally backslid. They, they, they had backslid and they didn't even know it. And they said, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. Now that might not be the answer we would expect. We might expect the wise to say, oh, I love you, honey. Here, have some of my oil. But they didn't say that, did they? And this has different layers of meaning. We can't impart salvation to anybody else. We, we, everyone has to be born again for themselves. We can't give the Holy Spirit to anybody. We can teach people how to receive the Holy Spirit, but they have to do that for themselves. And I tell you what, at this point in time, at the midnight cry, I don't think they'd probably be capable of much because it's going to be serious when that midnight cry comes. Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you. And this has a spiritual meaning, and it also has a physical meaning. It goes on to say, But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And in one sense of the word, I think that means Walmart. You know, a lot of people, when they see that life as we know it is going to be disrupted, uh, and it's time, and they run out at the last minute, and they try to find something, I tell you what, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be too late. The Philistines be upon you, Samson. The midnight cry, send your saddle home, John. It's too late. And it's too late for people to prepare. And it's too late for other people to help them to prepare. People need to wake up and be wise. They need to get their head out of the lap of Delilah. It also has a spiritual application. People that spend their time listening to the dispensationalist cult, to the prosperity pimps, and and the Hebrew root cult, you just pick one. They spend their time filling themselves with lies and delusions, and when it comes time when they need some real spiritual strength, they don't have the have any the Philistines be upon thee. They've got nothing in the heart because they believe lies. They bit their spirituality on a fraud about how to say a Hebrew word or pronounce God's name or upon some false prophetic scenario. Let me tell you what, and then the Lord will say, "Well, you go buy. You know, go to the." The, the popish hucksters, go to the prosperity pimps, go to the liars and the false teachers. You go to them that are selling the gospel and peddling it. You go and buy something from them now. I think there's a real ironic statement in that, and I think there's just some flat-out honesty here. People need to get right. You need to get right now. You need to wake up, get your head out of the lap of Delilah, because the midnight cry could come 
at any time. And when that midnight cry comes, you better be sure that all you got to do is trim your lamp, put your sandals on, and be ready to roll. Because at that time, there's not anyone that's going to be able to help you, even if they would want to. And in verse 9, it says, uh, it tells them to go to them that sell. And I, I tell you what, the door to the marriage is going to be shut in verse 10. And it says, when they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And when they were ready, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Now, when these people were trying to get ready, spiritually and physically at the last minute, the Lord came back and the door was shut. It was all over. And it was too late for them. You know, this happened before, didn't it? This happened back in the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16, And they went, and they that went in, went in male and female of flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut the door of the ark. Can't you just see Mo Noah? He pleaded with them. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He pleaded with them to repent. He said, here the ark is. Come on. Let's go. You can be saved. Come into the ark. They didn't listen. Can't you just see when the ark was lifting out of the water, how many people were trying to get on the ark, were trying to catch on to it in any way that they could, and it was too late. The door was shut on the ark, and let me tell you, the midnight cry is going to come, and the door is going to be shut, and people that are going to be foolish virgins, it's going to be too late for you because you have backslidden, you don't even know it. If you do not have that active principle of Christ in your heart that is giving you his presence and his peace to lead you, like the pillar of fire and the cloud of old, you have backslid. And there's nothing that anyone can do for you, even if they would want to. It's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. What a sad thing to hear that word that the door shut and to be knocking on the door and entrance be refused to you. In 11 and 12 of Matthew 25, afterward came also the other virgins. Virg I keep saying virgins, don't us. Virgins. Afterward also the other virgins came the afterward came also the other virgins saying Lord Lord open to us but he answered and said verily I say unto you I know you not it's impossible to honestly interpret this parable of the ten virgins in any way that the foolish virgins lost their salvation the Lord said, I don't know you. Now, it's interesting in the other parallel passages where Jesus taught this at different times, he phrased it in different ways. Here in Matthew 25, he says, I know you not. He didn't say, I have never known you. He says, I know you not right now. And notice there's going to be some people that... The Lord knew at one point in time that at one point a time were virgins, but have completely entered in to foolishness to where the Lord no longer knows them. And notice how he phrases it in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven... Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Many people think they're saved today that aren't saved at all. They're going to church. They're doing their little whatever they do. But the Lord has never known them. There's other people the Lord knew at one point in time, but he does not 
know them now. And there's another very profound verse as Jesus expressed the same thought at another time in Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. That means you put your little self out a little bit. Strive. If you are going to be a wise virgin, you're going to strive. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. That means there's one place you're going to go in to get this done. To be a pure virgin unto Christ, you've got to be dedicated to Christ his death on the cross, as we say, the C, the D, the E. You're going to be set apart under the doctrine of Christ. It's not optional. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not from whence ye are, or from where ye are. Yeah, you come right from the Masonic Lodge to the door of the kingdom. Nah, that don't work. Yeah, you came down from, uh, you see, people think they can be a part of abominations and not be held accountable for it. There, You know, if you're really following Jesus, you can't be where lies and abomination and idolatry are going to be lifted up. It's that simple. And he's going to say, I don't know you where you are or where you come from. You say you know me, but if you did, you wouldn't be where you're at doing what you do. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14, and verse 14, though these three men, Noah and Daniel and Job were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. The righteousness of Noah, Daniel, and Job, or my righteousness or yours, it can't save anybody. Everyone has to get saved for themselves. Everyone has to repent and believe the gospel. Nobody can do that for you. That's oil that I can't give to you. And Noah, and and these are the three men that are held out as examples of the end time remnant of God. Now Noah, he was a prepper, wasn't he? You know, so I think probably prepping isn't a real bad thing. Uh, prepping ain't the most important thing in the physical, but I tell you what, it's hard for someone to say that they believe what the Bible says about prophecy if you don't engage in some prepping. It's just impossible. Noah was the prepper. Daniel was the one that had the insight into the prophetic scriptures. And Job was the one that had the faith to endure any trial that he went through. And boy, Job went through some, didn't he? He went through physical pain. He went through the rejection of his family. He had it all, didn't he? The rejection of his family and friends. But Job and Daniel and Noah, they are our three great examples that Scripture holds out to us. In the last verse of this text, of this parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25, and in the 13th verse, Watch therefore, for ye ye know neither the day nor the hour, wherein the Son of Man cometh. Watch. That is the word to the wise virgins. Watch. And don't let the delay kill you. We'll close with the words of Jesus in Mark, the 13th chapter. And we'll read, beginning in verse 33. Take ye heed, watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. You don't know when that midnight cry is coming. So we better take heed, watch and pray. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. 
Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Now it's okay to sleep if your heart's waking, and all you got to do is trim your lamp and put your sandals on. But if you're sleeping in the lap of Delilah, and the Lord comes and finds you sleeping, it's not going to be well for you. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. And with that, we are going to conclude our study for this evening, as always, with great thanks for all of you that listen in and study with us. Uh, Tomorrow night, we will be over in the Now You See TV studios doing the Midnight Ride. And Sunday night on FOJC Radio, or FOJC Radio Rumble Channel. On our Rumble Channel, go to FOJCRadio.com. And you can go to our Rumble Channel at 8 p.m. Sunday night. And you will be live on the Redneck History Channel. Another uh, version of the Redneck History Channel. You're going to like this one. We're going to be introducing... Uh, a special guest, Mr. Joe Caruso, and he is a member of our local family here. It's going to be a show on Flat Earth, and I think you're going to like it, and I think you're going to be very impressed with Brother Joe. So we're really thankful to be able to present that material. It's going to be very, very awesome, I guarantee you. So with that, we're going to close out with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for all of your love and your mercy toward us. We just pray, Father, that you help us to be ready, that you just keep us awake, that you keep us wise and lead us by your Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we agree. Amen and amen. God bless you all, and we'll see you next Friday night, 6 p.m. Central on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. Thank you for listening and joining in fellowship with us here at FOJC Radio Remnant Gathering. You can contact us at FOJC Post Office Box 6 Seven one, Tell City, Indiana, four seven five eight six, or you can email us at lastdayschurch at cs dot com, or you may call us at eight one two eight three six two two eight eight. You can check out our website at www.fojcradio.com. dot com. Thanks and God bless.